Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Science on Tap. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Susan Knight. I work at the University of Wisconsin Trout Lake Station, just up the road here a bit. And Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, the idea that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. And at Science on Tap, you won't get a lecture, but you get an uh, interesting topic and then an opportunity to ask your own questions of an expert. I want to remind everybody of our partners at Science on Tap, University of Wisconsin Trout Lake Station, University of Wisconsin Kemp Natural Resources Station, uh, the Minocqua Public Library, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and our hosts here, the Minocqua Brewing Company. So thanks to everyone. And as always, we are funded in large part by a grant from the Brittingham Fund. And so thanks to them. I want to remind you all the different ways you can watch. Of course, some of you are all here right now. So that's one, probably the best way to watch is to actually be here in person. We also have live streaming at the Minocqua Public Library. Uh, and we also have live streaming for anyone with an internet connection fast enough to, to see it. Um, so you can just go to our Science on Tap Minocqua website and you should be able to click on Watch Now. Uh, it's available right away. And I've been asked to make a special point that you can, we also create um, archived videos. So you can watch the entire episode a couple of weeks after we show it. But not only that, we also have eight to 10 minute short videos uh, that we make that's it's not just condensed, it's a little bit of the introduction and a couple of the questions. And it's a really great way to get just a flavor of uh, what the whole show was about. So um, be sure to check those out. And we have a whole section on our uh, website for the Science on Tap shorts. And um, it's really, uh, I just watched one this morning from, if any of you were here from our um, talk on ospreys two months ago. So it was really great and really gives you a nice flavor of what he was talking about. Um, our next Science on Tap event will be June 5th, and our speaker will be Jason Fletcher from UW-Madison talking about the social implications of the genomics revolution. <laughs> revolution. Yeah, I guess it is a revolution. Revolution. Or in other words, what might, what might happen if you sign up for 23andMe and you get all that genetic information about yourself what happens to that information? What do you learn? Who's making use of it? All that kind of stuff. So it could be, we think that'll be a very, very interesting topic. And that will be our last one of the year. Um, I also want to make a note um, that each year, Kemp Natural Resources Station has a number of outreach events. And um, so uh, Scott Bovey, who's the director at, um, at Kemp, will be here a little bit later. So on your way out, please pick up a flyer about outreach events that will be at Kemp this summer. And there's actually one um, this Friday, fri or no, I'm sorry, not this Friday, next Friday, May 10th. Friday, May 10th at 7 p.m. And it's on painting timber doodles. Anybody know what a timber doodle is? Yes, it's a woodcock. So, um, and I'll read the, uh, the little blurb that they wrote, that Kemp wrote. Um, perhaps no other Wisconsin bird is as bizarre as the American woodcock. Learn about the woodcock's unique biology and the current research being done by graduate student Christopher Rowland. Following the presentation, those who wish may travel by personal vehicle to a nearby field site. At the site, we anticipate observing the male woodcock's strange courtship display. If conditions are right, we will attempt to use mist nets to capture band, and get an up-close look at the woodcock's strange appearance. Hiking will be on a maintained trail for a short distance. Uh, be sure to dress for the weather and bring a flashlight or a headlamp. It'll be getting dark. And again, that is Friday, May 10th at 7 p.m. at Kemp Natural Resources Station. And there's no registration fee. You can just show up. So that's all about Kemp. Um, tonight, we have Dr. John Lucy. Dr. Lucy is the director of the Center for Dairy Research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a professor of food science at UW-Madison.
The Center for Dairy Research, which is supported by dairy farmers through their milk sales, has over 30 researchers and is one of the premier dairy research centers in the United States. The center explores the functional flavor and physical properties of dairy products. I think that means he gets to taste test the ice cream. <laughs> Certainly the cheese. John oversees the Center for Dairy Research staff that provide innovation, education, and technical support for the dairy industry. And John also oversees more than 20 research projects uh, being conducted by the staff there. And Dr. Lucy grew up on a small dairy farm in County Cork, Ireland, and his eldest brother still runs the farm. While in college, he worked at a local milk powder plant which processed the milk from his farm and which likely contributed to his interest in understanding more about dairy products. So here's your trivia question for Dr. Lucy. Actually, it isn't really a trivia question. It's you just get to vote on the best answer, since there isn't really a correct answer. Okay. So when he was working in Ireland at the Dairy Research Center in County Cork, he came up with a new and very tasty cheese recipe. He found a local cheese factory to produce it, but the factory's marketing folks decided they wanted to capitalize on a famous singing group and named it Dubliner Cheese. So the problem is that Dublin is not only a city, but it's also the competitor cheese-making county competing with his county cork cheeses. So that just, what he, Dr. Lucy was just outraged, just outraged. He said it would be as if he came up with a wonderful cheese here in Wisconsin and marketers decide to call it California cheese. But I think we can come up with a much worse insult. Which of the following would be a worst name for Wisconsin created cheese? Minnesota Vikings cheese? <laughs> Chicago Bears cheese? Or maybe the Fighting Illini cheese? So one of those would definitely be a worse insult, although California cheese is pretty bad too. Dr. Lucy. So thank you all, and, and the best question that gets asked later is going to get some of the cheese. I brought some of the cheese if you haven't tasted before, so I, I brought some up with me. It is on sale uh, in the U.S. now. So I, I guess um, what I'd like to do today is have a kind of a conversation about um, cheese and dairy, and uh, then take questions. I know even in our dinner we're having downstairs, lots of random questions about milk and cheese and the dairy industry and stuff. So. I'm happy to try and address as many as I can as we get to that point. So what I want to do is, is draw a little bit back and go back a little bit in history to start off with and talk about uh, the dairy industry in Wisconsin. But first, I'm going to take us back to where cheese got started first. So early men used to bring either goats, sheep, or cows along with them so they would have milk and they would drink the milk. And if they wanted, they would ha had a source of meat so they would use these animals as important sustenance for them as they were, as they were um, developing. So cows, sheep, and goat were very close to man as they domesticated those. That's probably at least 10,000 years ago. What happened after that, uh, in, and where cheese gets into the story, is when they started to store the milk that they milked from the cows to drink it later, maybe that evening or that night or whenever they wanted to drink it, they didn't have a place to store it. So they actually used to use the stomach, the lining from the stomach as a bag to store the milk. They, remember, they don't have plastic, they don't have stainless steel uh, containers. So they were looking for places that they could store this as a bag and hold it. What would happen when they store the milk in these stomachs from these animals is that the milk would coagulate into soft cheese that looked a bit like cottage cheese after a few hours holding there. They didn't know why, but they knew if they put it into a pot, just an earthenware pot or a porcelain pot, it never happened. It only happened when they stored it in the stomach linings of these animals. So they knew there was something in there. That's something we call now rennet. It's an enzyme that's secreted in the lining of stomachs from animals like sheep, goat, and cows. Now, they thought this is nice, this cottage cheese or soft cheese type product. So they said, how can we make this rather than having to store it in these um, sacks of stomach lining of animals because we don't have that all the time. So what they did is when they would kill an, a, a young animal, like a calf or something, 
they would take out the linings and they would wash it with salt solutions or brine solutions and collect the salt solutions and put it away. They somehow figured out that if they did that, enough of this magic ingredient that they didn't know about was collected in the salt solution and all they had to do is take a drop of that, put it into milk for cheese making and it would coagulate it. And that literally was the way for thousands of years that people would use to make cheese, is collect this rennet that came from primarily from calves and they would store it in salt solutions and spread, uh, spread that into the milk, a small amount of it. It's only in modern day that we have some other ways to coagulate this milk. Cheese making spread across Europe and primarily one of the, one of the groups that was very important when spreading cheese making across, across Europe was the Romans. Remember the Roman Empire covered much of the modern world at that stage and countries that didn't have cheese making got cheese making because the Romans loved cheese. That brought cheese into the UK when the Romans came there. They didn't have it before, as far as we know. And then the English who came over here in the, uh, in, in the Mayflower, etc., they brought cheese making to the US, their type of cheese making to the US. Primarily, cheese, early cheese making here in the US was focused mostly out of places like New York and so on. So the early capital of dairy here in the, in the US or the main places of dairy was New England, New York. At that time, milk didn't have a lot of, we didn't have pasteurization, we didn't have refrigerators. So cows literally used to stay near the population center. So there was literally herds of cows within <laughs> New York City or very close to the cities. So the early settlers here in Wisconsin, going back to around 1800 to 1830, were primarily Yankee farmers that came from New England that had spread west into the, the states as they were opening up. And they brought their cheese making uh, experience with them. But primarily those Yankee farmers, as we would call them now, those Yankee farmers were interested in wheat. So Wisconsin at that time was considered America's breadbasket and that it was the cause of damming lots of our rivers here within the, the state to actually have mills to um, process the wheat. That, that continued for a, a number of decades, but those farmers were not very, let's call it, they weren't managing the soil very well, and the soil started to get depleted. So crop yields from wheat started to go down, and they started to look about somewhere else. Eventually they would move to places like Kansas as the, as the West opened up. They also were, the crops started to get ravaged by all sorts of pests, there was all sorts of cinch beetles and all sorts of things that would ravage the crops. So by the time, just after the Civil War here in the state, Wisconsin was at a, a significant crossroads. It had been America's breadbasket for, for several decades and produced massive amounts of wheat, but it was really wondering what to do. A lot of farmers were losing money and going out of business. And so that brings me to a very influential uh, group of, of people and one of the first ones I want to talk about is, is Horde, who eventually became a governor here uh, in the state of Wisconsin and also set up several newspapers and eventually one of them became Horde's Dairyman, which is still probably the most recognizable dairy publication globally, focusing on farm and farm agribusiness type of thing. Horde had come in from New York one of the things you'll notice, uh, I'll mention a few other key people who have kind of created the dairy industry in Wisconsin, almost all of them came from New York. Many of them went to school in Cornell. Touchy point, you know, at Madison, but, <laughs> but that, that's the story. So individuals like Horde recognized that farming was at a crisis stage here. So with, with his newspapers and Horde's Dairymen, he was also very influential, influential in a couple of major dairy associations, including the Wisconsin Dairymen's Association, which then became a very powerful group within Wisconsin to try and educate farmers on new technologies. And they basically tried to convince farmers that wheat was old news and it was moving west. But here, he recognized and other influential people recognized that our climate, our soils, really was suited for daring. He had a slogan that he would go around to meetings and uh, uh, groups with farmers and say, swap your plow for the cow, okay? 
He was trying to tell them, get out of this wheat business. You're not making any money in it. The yields are going down. Your soils are depleted. Go, go after dairying. It also, it also um, corresponded to the same time where there was an influx of Norwegians, uh, uh, Germans, Italians, Swiss, were starting to migrate into Wisconsin around that time. They were bringing their knowledge of dairying. They're also the, uh, the growing of crops, feed crops and other crops to feed the animals. And they also brought their cheese making knowledge as well from their home countries. So over the last couple of decades of um, the previous century, not the century, the century before, up till about 1900, there was a major change within Wisconsin from being the breadbasket before that to becoming a growing dairy state. Up till that point, the dairy king of dairy and the uh, dairy states in the U.S. was New York. And it took another couple of decades before Wisconsin passed out New York in terms of milk production or even cheese production. And it took a couple of things. The second major thing was that a dairy school was founded at the UW-Madison. And the first dairy school was at 1890. And there still is a dairy program going on, and I work in that dairy program. And that created training and short courses and activities related to training people on how to process milk, how to make cheese, how to standardize cheese, and so on. And one of the most influential people in getting Wisconsin on the map was Babcock. Babcock, by the way, I guess where he came from? <laughs> Cornell. <laughs> okay? Came from New York, came from Cornell, had been trained there, and came as an agricultural chemist. And he was charged at the time, there were agricultural experiments and stations set up in many parts of the US, and he was part of that, and he was charged when he came here by the dean of the college, go find a way to quantify fat in milk, because there was a big worry about adulteration of milk. Farmers were adding water or other materials to their milk and saying, I'll get more volume if I have more cans of milk every morning, but it was destroying the quality of the products. So the idea was, well, how are we going to figure out if they've adulterated the milk with water, added water to it, is let's test the fat. And if the fat goes down, we know they've added water. So he perfected a brand new test for fat in milk, revolutionized it, because before that, the only tests that could be done for fat were super complicated tests that would take trained analytical chemists maybe days to do and were not feasible for any kind of routine or large-scale testing of, of fat. He simplified something that even the most basic trained person could do in a very short period of time. So it solved the adulteration problem, but actually what it did is allowed daring to take on a kind of an industrial revolution. They could now quantify the amount of fat in milk, and they could quantify it for making cheese, have the right amount of fat to make their cheese, have the right amount of fat to make butter, and it also corresponded with a number of other innovations in terms of separators that could, mechanical separators that could separate cream. So it was the start of a kind of a glorious age. Coincidentally, Babcock did not believe in patenting his work. He actually didn't believe in doing much publishing of his work either. He was really more interested in finding it out and then talking about it and then moving on to the next discovery. So he decided not to patent that technology, although it probably would have made a lot of money because it was the first fat test globally. And I've been to meetings in New Zealand and they talk about the history of dairy globally and one of the first milestones they put up there is Babcock's fat test coming out of Madison. But he decided not. His idea was that science was for everybody and he wanted to get it out there quickly. Within a few decades, Wisconsin had over 2,000 cheese factories here within the state. One of the things Wisconsin did that distinguished itself from all the other states, and it's true to this day, is people like Horde and some of the influential organizations, including the later Wisconsin Cheesemakers, which are still a very active organization here, is they said, we must protect quality in the state, not just quantity, we must protect quality. And what did that mean? They said, you're gonna need to be licensed to do any key thing. So if you want to make cheese, you're going to need a cheesemaker's license. That requires over 240 hours of apprenticeship to be able to make it. It requires you pass an exam. If you want, we were just talking downstairs about grading cheese to know which cheese is good and bad and whether it'll age well. That's a licensed thing as well. If you want to pasteurize milk, you've got to need a license for that. 
So Wisconsin became very, um, very focused on making sure that everybody was trained and had licenses, not just anybody making the stuff. Because before that, this had started off as kind of a farmstead operation where everybody was making and everybody had a cheese vat and everybody was making stuff. But that doesn't give you a lot of great quality. I'm sure some of it was good, but I'm sure a lot of it was not good. And Wisconsin really want to focus on that. And that's true to this day as well. Now, as these plants got bigger, um, the smaller ones disappeared. And over the, the decades, we're now down to only 200 dairy plants in the state, with about 120 plus cheese plants within the state. So that, that is from the 2000 <laughs> down to 123. These plants range from the biggest ones you will finally find in the US, or close to the biggest ones in the US, down to the artisan with some sheep or goats and small uh, production that they're making on a daily basis. So we have all of those. However, that has not been that Wisconsin has disappeared from the dairy universe. We're still America's dairy land. So right now, we produce a quarter of all cheese produced in the US. And to give you an idea what that means globally, if Wisconsin was a country, sometimes we do think ourselves as a country, here in Wisconsin too, I know, we would be the fourth largest cheese producing country in the world, okay? So that is significant amount of cheese. And it also means that we're not just producing lots of cheese, but we make over 600 types or styles of cheese, so a lot of different types of cheeses. And the other thing we do, and we were just talking about it downstairs at, at, uh, at um, supper, was that we make 50% of all specialty cheese. That's the value added stuff. Some of those specialty cheese, can, you can buy them in stores for $25, $30 a pound rather than commodity cheddar. We do produce a lot of commodity cheese here, but we also produce a lot of the best quality specialty cheese in, in the country. One of the things we do, and one of the things that at the center we do, is we strive to try and increase the quality or improve the, 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 the standards of our cheesemakers. And one of the places we look for that is look back to Europe, because Europe, with its long tradition of making cheeses and a lot of skills and crafts in it, we look back and see what have they done. So this year, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of our master cheesemaker program that was set up uh, at, the, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and now has over 70 trained, uh, ma licensed master cheesemakers. What this was, was really uh, looking back to, in Europe, there's a lot of guilds and crafts and other kind of highly artisan trades, not just in the cheesemaking side, but in many other types of sectors as well. And really, that has been going on in many cases in some professions for thousands of years. The idea is to have the highest and the best of the best and recognize them within your associations and in your group. We recognize that within the center and created our own master cheesemaker program. And as I say, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of it this year. To, to become a master cheesemaker, you have to be licensed to make cheese in Wisconsin for 10 years. 10 years you have to be making cheese. You have to pass an exam you have to have an audit of your plant and your cheeses, and you also get an oral interview with master cheesemakers and our staff to see if you really understand depth of cheese. I mean, obviously the cheesemakers we have know their cheese, but can they answer questions about why is that, what's happening if this doesn't work, what happens if this goes wrong, do you understand how to problem solve? If they don't reach that standard the first time, we tell them to take some more classes and courses. So we put on somewhere between 20 to 30 short courses and training programs in all aspects of cheese making down at Madison every year. And their cheese makers come to learn. And, and the master cheese makers come to learn. And one of the things we've tried to do to push the specialty cheese is really we have a specialty cheese program, which the master cheese maker program is part of. But what we do is we Every year, we focus on one country around the world and do a short course in that country. We've done short courses on Mexico, Poland, Ireland and UK, um, uh, France, Switzerland, Scandinavian cheeses, German cheeses, etc. We will bring in speakers 
trained individuals from those countries and bring them in for two or three days and have our cheese makers make cheese alongside them and talk about what they can learn and what techniques are available there to make cheese around the world. Just to up the standard of our cheese makers here, and we have fantastic cheese makers in the state. At the last um, cheese contest, we just gave out the awards um, a couple of weeks ago uh, at, the, at the Wisconsin Cheese Makers um, annual meeting, our cheese makers won more medals than everybody else combined. Actually, five times more than the next state. So our cheese makers make phenomenal, high quality cheeses. Um, and I think it continues to this day with the specialty cheese program and the master cheese maker program. So I want to tell you a little bit about other things we do at our, at our center. I just told you that we run the master cheese maker program. That was our baby and we continue to run it with funding from the Milk Marketing Board of Wisconsin, now called Dairy Farmers. Um, we run a food safety program, so we, we're very focused in this state of making high quality but safe products, um, which any kind of outbreak related to dairy product would damage the reputation of our cheese makers and also obviously harm consumers. So we have run a food safety training program since the mid-1990s, the first uh, in, the, in, the, in the country. We also look at other dairy products beyond cheese and milk powders and whey powders and stuff like that. We do a lot of research on those. We also work on things like Greek yogurt, and we were one of the first groups to start making it and testing it and talking about it. Um, so we do a lot of different programs related to the technologies or new processes. As mentioned at the start, we have close to 40 staff actually down there. So we are the largest dairy center in the U.S. by far, and we work with over 100 companies a year on product development or troubleshooting. One way to kind of characterize us, we're kind of doctor on call. <laughs> so when plants have problems or questions, they call us, and we either try and answer it over the phone or we make a plant visit, like a doctor house call. We do that all the time. I'm lucky that I don't have to visit any plants tomorrow on my way back down, but that's unusual. Most of our staff, when we go traveling the state, will visit four or five plants, talking to them about what their issues are, what are they developing, what kind of issues can we help them with, or what further work is needed. A couple of things that you may not be aware of things we do. The U.S., up till recently, the U.S. was still a net importer of cheese. Primarily, people like to buy Italian cheeses or French cheeses, especially the high-end restaurants would still, even though we make very good quality cheeses, many of them wanted to buy those kind of cheeses because maybe they have a reputation or a brand. About five years ago, the U.S. for the first time it became a net exporter of cheese. And now about 6% of our cheese is exported to some part of the world. And a lot of the research we're doing right now is how can we import, increase our exports of cheese? How can we sell it to China, Middle East, more to Latin America? That's big research effort from us right now. We also, I don't know, some of you may have heard, we just received a $1 million grant from a combination of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corp plus the Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin to actually create a beverage innovation facility down in, at, at Babcock Hall. What that means is, and some of us were joking about it earlier, was you could now make milk that doesn't need to be refrigerated because of the processing developments that have happened. The milk can be heated to very high temperatures for a couple of seconds and then packaged in an aseptic or sterile environment that milk can sit outside without refrigeration for months. This is a game changer for many of our products because it could allow us to sell milk or something like milk or some product that has um, dairy or proteins or something in it or, or, or some component of milk. It could allow us to sell it and leave it sit on the counter here or sit at any uh, location or any store or any place without needing to be in a refrigerated case. The refrigerator case l um, limits the amount of places we can sell dairy, and it's very perishable. Milk would only last a couple of weeks, so it's really a short shelf life type of product. So this will be a game changer for us. So I'd like to pause maybe there, because I've told you a lot of kind of information. Um, and, and maybe we'll take some questions if you, if you like. One of the other books I'll put up here while we're getting ready for that is there's a couple of great books on how cheese making got started and our history here. 
obviously our local communities around, but uh, Jerry Epps, and he's actually, I know he's updating this at the moment because he wanted to update our little section on CDR in there. But it's, it's a great book, talking about historical pictures of the first cheese factory in the US um, and, and the, the names of families and groups and stuff and locations. Uh, that's, a, that's a great book if you want to kind of learn about how we got started here in Wisconsin. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Could you comment on the business plan? I mean, how this works. So you're developing these specialty cheeses. So how are they handed off? <laughs> and what kind of monetary exchanges are involved here? Yes. And, and what benefits the university monetarily? So there's two types of people who might be interested in a new cheese variety. They could be existing plants that just want to get another variety. So they come to us for training, and they pay a fee for doing some training. But our funding is our center gets 70% of its operating budget from the dairy farmers to the checkoff program. So we try, we're basically, we're being subsidized by the dairy farmers to create new markets for milk. So what we do is we charge a nominal fee or a low fee just to go out and help plants if they're developing a specialty cheese. The, the people who are not making cheese at the moment, that's a harder kind of question. When, when, and people come to us all the time saying, I'd love to start making cheese, and hey, it sounds cool, and maybe it's a hobby or something. So what we do with them is, first of all, we want to figure out, do they have the financial resources to actually make this a success, just like any business? Do they have a business plan? If they don't, there actually are quite a lot of resources that are available to them to help them assist them getting started. Because they might need a business plan, what is their marketing plan, what, how, who are they going to sell it to? There's many important questions that have nothing to do with the, with the cheese recipe or the technical sides of it. One of the most famous cheeses here in our state is made, and it's called Pleasant Ridge Reserve. It has won more national titles than any other cheese in our state. Um, that was started by a guy who'd retired from Xerox out in um, Silicon Valley. Didn't know anything about making cheese, but he had a business plan. He had a concept for the cheese. He had an idea for marketing distribution. And when we worked with him, we basically said, OK, um, you have some challenges. You don't have any cows. <laughs> you, do, you don't have any milk. <laughs> you don't have a cheese plant. And you don't know what cheese you want to make yet. But we can fix all of those things. What, what actually happened in that case, there was a plant nearby that actually said, we don't make cheese on the weekends. You can come in on the weekends, we'll pay you some fee, or you'll have to pay us some fee for use of our facilities at the weekends to actually make the cheese to get you started. That was successful, he built his own small plant, he partnered with a farmer to get a herd, and we just perfected the recipe for him, basically. But all the rest of it, they have to have a business plan, have to have something to get them going. I, I hope that, that kind of answers the question, sorry. One of the um, interesting places close by that people might want to visit and you're probably familiar with, a um, woman is from the Netherlands, Marieka, I think is the yep. way her name's pronounced. Marika, yep. Marika, and mm -hmm. she, um, she produces a variety of Gouda, and I think a lot of us think of Gouda as almost bouncing balls, but this is like, it's wonderful cheese, and it's such an interesting place to visit in that they have the animals, they have the milk piped over to the cheese plant, you know, you can see the whole operation, and it's really exciting. It's great. Mar Marika just picked up the, um, just probably about two weeks ago, we had the, the award ceremony for the U.S. Cheese Championships, which was held down in Madison, and she picked up the second and third place prizes for her Gouda. And so, uh, outstanding quality cheese. So, again, it's, it's an example of where people have come in with new ideas, and new suggestions and new varieties. Here in, here in Wisconsin, there wasn't a lot of Gouda made in the past, traditional Dutch Gouda. So I think that's just an example. Over the last 100 years ago, we've had a lot of people coming in from Switzerland and other places, Italians coming into our state, that had made cheeses in their, in their home countries. In many cases, they brought the cheese-making equipment, they bought the cheese-makers, they brought them over here and transplanted them and started to make cheese here with our Wisconsin milk. So I think that continues to this day. Um, I keep hearing on the news about how the dairy farmers are in trouble, uh, mm -hmm. milk farmers, yep. um, and they have to sell their farm. And 
who are they selling their farm to and why is this happening? So we have a program um, that's based not just at UW-Madison, but also at Platteville and River Falls called the Center for Dairy Profitability and looking at the economics of farming and farming uh, activities. And so there's a couple of great resources there like Mark, Mark Stevenson. So I'm not an, uh, an economics expert. Here, here's what I would tell you is that farmers are getting many cases for, for, the, for the individual business below what they need to survive for, the, for their um, milk right now. They have been low for at least four years. So many farmers are not able to make any profit or some of them are losing money at that price of milk right now. Some farms that maybe don't have as much um, debt or have not taken on as much debt, they can manage, maybe are even making profit if they're large enough. But there are many farmers in a group that really see this as they're not getting enough for their milk. If they invest more, they'll be further in debt and they don't see a way out. So many of them have gone out in, in record numbers over the last couple of years. Milk prices are slowly increasing this year, but not a massive recovery back to the levels it was about four or five years ago, which really was not only, a, only a high for a period of time. So what's the cause of that is kind of a big topic. There's actually a Wisconsin Dairy Task Force that is just wrapping up that is made up of over 30 farmers, association, experts, um, I, I, I was part of that as a, a resource person, a couple of people from the university were there. There's no simple fix. One of the challenges is that Wisconsin and many other states have ramped up milk production significantly in the last number of years. In fact, there's been a number of significant programs encouraging farmers to produce a lot more milk. But there hasn't been enough markets for all of that milk. Too much milk, without enough markets, you're going to depress the price, basically. Globally, we're tied into the global market now, and many of the products we want to um, produce here in the, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. in terms of milk powders and cheese, many of them are exported. Europe had quotas or limited production on their dairy farms for about 30 years. But about four years ago, the Europeans decided to get rid of farm milk quotas and abolish them completely. What that, what that change meant is that farmers could produce as much milk as they like. Back in Ireland, my, my brother is one of them, he's producing maybe 30% more milk than he did five or six years ago. So what you have is a lot more milk coming from Europe, Wisconsin producing a lot more milk, too much milk on the global market, prices come down, basically. So there isn't a, there isn't a simple short-term fix to this. Um, in our, we don't work at the farm level, we work at the product and the cheese plant and everything level. The only things I can say is we need to get into higher value added products that are not commodities. That will give much more return back to the plant and back to the farm. And the farmers that are closely tied to plants that are making high value added cheeses, they're still getting a significant better return than just people who are going into commoditized kind of products. And that's kind of what, what we still try, uh, strive to do. Um, uh, back to your... Um uh, point that um, cheese came over from the Europeans. Was mm -hmm. there any indication that Native Americans made cheese anywhere in the country? No, they didn't have cows. They didn't and have so cows? No. So the horses weren't here either. So, so the, you can, mm. the cows came over with the Europeans? Cows, horses, all okay. of those came over. Okay. I, I, I would visit it. Um, I spent four years in New Zealand, but one of the curiosities over there, they started about 10 years ago, they started milking deer. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually farms in New Zealand and they literally raise deer and they milk them. <laughs> now, the, I, what I'm told is the yields are very bad. <laughs> they don't get a lot of milk, but they literally milk deer. And the deer are not very domesticated yet. So they, one of my friends showed me from New Zealand, showed me that to milk them, they kick like crazy. You have to put them into these kind of stalls so they don't kick all the stuff up. So, but. Maybe if they'd learned to deer over here and had milk producing deer, they might have had mil milk and cheese here before the Europeans arrived. So, don't know. Right. Two, one quick question and a, a more serious question. I'm still thinking about what's the best question I got asked. We'll have to confer on this afterwards. <laughs> There's some cheese here. I, I saw an ad literally last night on television for a dessert that touted the fact that they were using ultra-filtered milk to mm -hmm. make the dessert smoother. Yep. 
what's ultra filtered milk? What I mean, there's fat, there's solids, and there's probably a few <laughs> hair many, in there. But how what many else? People, you? How many people here have drank Fair Life's milk? Has anybody here drank Fair Life's milk? I, I don't bring it, but it's a pro, uh, it's a product uh, that's probably. I think they're talking about that brand. Fair Life is backed by Coca Cola, and. Um, Fair Oaks are in Bobna, down in Indiana, you know, the big uh, destination farm where you can go to with buses and so on. I don't know if anybody have been there. Um, so, but it is lactose-free. It is 50% more protein, I think 30-something percent more calcium and lactose-free. So what is ultrafiltration? Basically what they do is they run it through filters, and there's special filters you can buy, and we research it all the time, so the technology is available right now for anybody to do, and we use it for whey processing. You run the milk through this filter, and it leaves the lactose, which is very small, go through, and you retain the protein because it's a little bit different in size. And you can scale the size of your filters to leave things go through and other things to be retained. And this is done at a massive scale. This is not little filters you'd have in the home or something like this. This is done with pumps, stainless steel, etc. But literally, they are filters that retain something, and they retain fat and protein, and they leave the lactose go through. By doing that, you can concentrate up the protein in your milk to whatever you want to go. That technology is what is used to make whey protein concentrates. So if you go to like a sports nutrition store or a GNC store, and you see these big containers of whey proteins that the bodybuilders and the college athletes and high school athletes, it seems now, everybody, they, they, they consume for protein. That's how they get the higher protein products because they filter it through the same filters, these ultrafiltration filters. They filter it, it retains the protein, but the lactose and the sugars go through. That's what they're trying to do. They don't want the sugar, they want the protein. That technology is around, and as I say, it's very attractive for some beverage products because people are interested in protein and maybe not so interested in just carbohydrates or sugar. And some people are lactose intolerant too. So ultrafiltration, one of the challenges we face in the dairy industry is very highly regulated because lots of people consume it, including children. That is good for safety and quality, but it's bad for innovation. <laughs> because what I mean by that is if you want to create some new technology, sometimes you're not allowed to do it. So for example, when Fairlife were trying to launch this product, they literally couldn't call it milk. They could call it ultra-filtered milk, but they couldn't call it your gallon jug because <laughs> that has very rigorous standards on how it's made and only certain types of technologies. The quality is perfectly the same between the two. It's just that the technology used to make it has not been updated in some of the standards for milk. So um, I was mentioning about our, our beverage innovation center. We probably won't even go after the gallon jug. We'll go for all this new space because I think there's a lot more interesting products that could be maybe more higher value than the gallon jug, which is very commoditized. And there's really, they, they watch the nickels and <laughs> everything on how it's produced. It's very hard to get much innovation there. But ultrafiltration, it's coal filtered for the people who are used to in the, in the brewing industry, in the beer industry. So it, it really is a very gentle filtering technology. How would it make? Yes. If you, in, rather than using milk to make ice cream, you can first of all concentrate it up and have higher protein and fat if you want to, but higher protein in the product using this filtration and substitute that for milk. And the product that is creamier, it also probably will have a little bit higher protein, depending on how they do it as well. So. One of the hot brands in yogurt right now, I don't know if you've come across it, is called Halo or Halo Top. And they are a hugely popular ice cream brand. It's got one of the big entrepreneurial awards last year for growth within the ice cream sector. And that is a high protein ice cream. And they're going after this craze of people saying, well, ice cream is kind of bad for you, kind of too many fat, too many calories. Hey, but it's got more protein. It's good, I can eat it. So people feel better about it because it's got more protein in it. Whether I, I'm not too sure nutritionally whether it's any better, but people feel better because of it. Uh, so what's the difference between, say, Greek and Roman yogurt? And then uh, <laughs> are, are the large uh, CAFO uh, dairy farms the ones that, and, say, the bovine growth hormone uh, driving the smaller uh, 
dairy farms out of business because of the increased production? Yeah, so let, let me take the, um, the bovine growth hormone first. So when this, when this, um, this started to become popular, the, the, the attraction of using something like an injectable form or another form to give to animals was that if you gave it to animals, you would get a boost, significant boost in milk production. And therefore, the animals would produce more milk they would have to get some more feed, but the, but, the, but the game was that if you gave them some of this, you would get a lot more milk for the animals, so there would be a production increase for the farmers. The cows already themselves produce growth hormones and use it for whether it's deciding to milk or give up milking, they produce different types of hormones from it. So it really was a technology just to spike them a little bit to actually get them to produce more milk. Because of a backlash on consumers worried about what this hormone was, in fact, in our bodies, we have all of these hormones ourselves. So there's, n you know, I hear hormone-free, and I think that's the silliest thing I've ever heard, because our bodies and plants and many other things are full of hormones. But because consumers were concerned about it, there's very little BST um, used now within the Wisconsin dairy industry. It's really, it's really dropped away significantly over the last 10 or 15 years. So it, it, I don't think it is, it is now an issue because most people have, have moved on from that from a farmer point of view and plant point of view. Uh, the this, this second question, so yes, when it was occurring, the larger farmers could afford the people who would do the injections and, and do this administer the program and maybe the smaller ones did not. So they would have, the, the medium and larger ones would have this productivity or more milk production than the smaller ones. But as I say, right now, I, I don't see that many people are doing it, and most, most dairies have moved away from it just because they don't see a benefit from it, and there's consumer concerns about it. In terms of Greek yogurt, it's a complete misnomer, the word Greek, because the Greeks actually didn't come up with what, what I call, as a scientist, concentrated yogurt. So it's yogurt that is not just made out of milk, it's made out of something that's higher in protein or solids. It probably came from Lebanon or Syria or somewhere in the Middle East. And it moved from there to countries like Greece over time. What it was originally was that they would make yogurt, so basically they would take milk, heat it, and add a culture to it. Then what they would do after the fermentation was they would put it in a bag, and they would hang the bag literally around here. They would probably hang bags all around here on the walls or off the ceilings. And some water would drip out of the bag over time, and that water coming out of it would make the cheese inside there more concentrated, thicker. And that literally was what um, Greek yogurt or concentrated yogurt was for many, many years. Until more recently, people use machines to do that versus using these bags, because bags, it takes time, you have to hang them up, it's not very clean, and it takes a long time to do that. And it's not kind of large scale. So there isn't any federal standard for Greek or concentrated yogurt here in the U.S. Lots of people have anywhere between, you know, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 percent protein in it. So you have to be careful what you're buying if you really want a high protein product. They also change the size of the containers to so that you, <laughs> you may be buying something that says it has a lot of protein in it, but the container might be small. You know, so you have to watch out in terms of what the serving size is for it. But there are products, and we've worked with companies to develop products, including some of the Icelandic yogurts, and you can get products that have 20 grams of protein per container. And that's a lot of protein. I mean, per, on a daily basis, we're supposed to consume somewhere like 50 grams of protein, at least. You're getting 20 from just one yogurt container. So it, it's, it's, an interesting, um, it's an interesting product category, and I think it's, it's maybe maturing, flattening off now. It was rapid growth for about 10 years. I have a question. I feel like recently I've had a lot of conversations with friends about the word milk. And in mm -hmm. the dairy industry, do you take offense to almonds and coconuts using the word milk mm -hmm. for their products? Uh, okay, yeah. Yep. I mean, this is the kind of conversations you have over beer, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So, the, so there's a couple of points in that. Um, it's, it's very interesting. The federal government seems very good at enforcing certain rules and other rules it doesn't want to enforce. And it seems to pick those pretty arbitrarily. And, and that's part of the frustration that you see in the dairy industry right now. 
Why, why I say that is within the federal standards, they say that milk is the lacteal secretion of the mammary gland from some lactating mammal. That covers you know, cow, sheep, goat, etc. Because that's something that mammals produce to feed their young. All of these others, obviously, you know, almonds don't have lactating <laughs> um, organs or anything like that. So the trouble is that the federal government did not clamp down on them the moment they started to use these words. And that they have started not this year or last year. They've been using it for many years. They did ignored it even though it's in contravention of their standards and the definitions for these dairy products. In the past, you know, I had a book up here, an autobiography or a biography on Hoard, um, over 100 years ago, one of his major campaigns was about fake cheese and about fake butter, and the margarine industry was starting. So it seems like we go around <laughs> in cycles about it. And I think the issue for me is, yes, there's not... Um, the, the federal government is not enforcing standards that it should, which doesn't make any sense. The many other aspects, they enforce standards. But one of, the, one of the things that concerns me is many of these products that people are making, they are not actually nutritionally equivalent to milk. So I'm a food chemist by training. And if you look at some of these products, some of the products that come out have very low levels of protein. They have very low levels of calcium. We know that dairy or milk is an important nutrient, and maybe there's about eight or nine categories of nutrients or vitamins or minerals that are important contributors to our diet that comes from milk or dairy products. Many of these have one thing in them that they're contributing. I believe many consumers think almond milk is probably flavored with almonds, <laughs> but it comes from cows, and that's the confusion that many of them have. These people don't spend a lot of time worrying about where things come from, and they heard about you know, chocolate milk and vanilla milk, and okay, almond milk must be flavored with it. They really don't know. So there's, there's a confusion by people thinking they're getting the benefits of true dairy, and it's just new flavors. And the other problem I have is it's really nothing of them is nutritionally equivalent. It gets even worse when you talk about some of these fake cheeses that are out there. Some of them don't contain any protein. <laughs> They're just starches and carbohydrates and other gums that are put together. I wouldn't have any problem if they came out and enforced the standards that say, if your product, so that literally what the federal standards say, you're entitled to make something that looks like a standard of identity product, but, and that's the big but, you must make your product nutritionally equivalent. If you come up with some crazy kind of idea, you're allowed to do it, but you must make sure it's got all the fat, protein, vitamins, minerals, everything. And that's been the standard for decades, and that's also not been enforced. So there's, that's where there's a lot of frustration, I think, out in the dairy industry. They look at that, and we were just talking about farmers you know, having a low uh, milk price. They see all these newbies that really are not uh, coming in, and they're using the word milk or butter or cheese. And they, they look at it and say, but God, they're crap. You know, they don't have any ingredients. They don't have any nutrients. Why are they allowed to do that and get more, more value for it and they're taken away from us? So farmers are looking at that and farmers are pretty upset about it. To my attitude, I don't understand. The federal government doesn't seem to spend much time enforcing pretty basic kind of standards. But there are many, many federal regulations that they enforce every day that cause a lot of grief for the dairy industry. So there's this kind of something going on there. Yeah, um, we just talked about the price of milk mm -hmm. being low now compared to what it was five or 10 years ago. Yep. How do they price milk? Is it by 100 weight? Yeah. And, and what were the prices five years ago compared to now? Because I just heard a program on public radio and I was mm -hmm. driving for about an hour and a half and the guy was talking about the formula for pricing milk yep. and it's very complicated and it was so complicated he never got to the, pri the formula in that whole hour show. Yes. Um, yes. Why is it so complicated? And, and what were the prices five years ago or 10 years ago compared to now? Yep. So prices have gone up and gone down. The, there, there was a period about five years ago where uh, milk prices were over $20 a hundredweight, and now they're down about 15. So that's a significant reduction. It wasn't always as high as that, so it has gone up. 
up and down over the years and cycled. The, the federal, the, the problem is there, there are classes of milk going for different type of uses. Some milk is used to make bottled milk, some milk is used to make cheese, and some milk is for other purposes. Each of those has their own classes. The federal system is not a simple system to figure out what, how they price milk. It's based on components, so how much fat, protein, other things, so that's part of it. It's, it's another part of the formula is about how much you produce, so the volume is in there. There's parts of it that say, if you make this and you make it into cheese, we expect you can make some money out of the cheese in the way, and they try and calculate that and put it back into the milk pricing system as well. They literally, <clears throat> the, the joke is that there are probably about five people in the US that truly understand how the milk pricing system really works. Yeah, so there are probably too many classes is one comment that I hear routinely. And the second is, in this system, which is changed and driven by the federal government and, and the way they do it, is that it probably needs some more signals in there and also more return back to the farmers. So they're the two concerns that I hear. The farmers say, well, somebody's selling it into, let's say, Greek yogurt or some high-end cheese, but I'm not getting any more money than if they sell more of it. They're not getting enough return. Milk pricing in the U.S. is very complicated, much more complicated than any other country in the world as far as I'm aware, primarily because it's driven by the federal system, the federal milk pricing and market orders. I don't think that's an easy thing to fix. There are some suggestions that have come out to try and tweak that or adjust that or change some of the classes, but knowing the way the federal government works on anything, I wouldn't hold my hold my hat on anything happening soon. One of the problems, as I said, is that over the last four or five years, some we expect to export some of our milk and some type of product. Right now, about 15% of the milk we produce in the US gets exported. To, to really get, to move the needle in terms of price back to the farmers, the prediction is we probably need to export about 20% of our milk in some shape or form. And there is ambitious goals by the U.S. Dairy Export Council and factories to get more milk exported. Because if we can get more milk and get some good price for it somewhere in the world, then we have more value here at home. We're not flooding our own market. That's kind of simplistically the way they're thinking about it. Um, we biked and hiked through Ireland, and yep. the cows lead kind of an idyllic life there, it mm -hmm. seems. Yes. Um, we also <laughs> went to California, where there's thousands of cows together underneath these these structures in the middle of a desert, it seems horrible. But anyway, does where a cow is raised, does that affect their quality of milk in any way, shape, or form? Well, the Irish milk is obviously much better I, I than know, California. I know, I know, mean, it's wonderful. I mean, uh, that's, we buy carry gold. <laughs> give, give the prize for the best question already over here. <laughs> <laughs> we do buy carry gold butter, by the way. <laughs> so. So I'm going to digress and talk about carry gold butter for a second before oh, I come no, back to your question. So, so Kerry Gold is uh, a brand that was created in the late 60s, and actually the guy who created it actually went on to be the, the chief executive for Heinz here in the US. So, but his first job, he was actually a rugby player too in Ireland, and he used to come to all the rugby games, international games, in a Rolls Royce, <laughs> because he was already a chief executive when he was in his 20s. But he came up with the concept of an Irish brand, and which became Kerry Gold. And that's the brand that they use for butter, as you say, but it's also for cheese when they export it out of Ireland. The Kerrygold butter is worth about a billion dollar brand. A billion dollar brand. Started from the 1960s. Uh, Kerrygold butter is different from US butter. We actually did a butter making lab last Friday with Bob Bradley, who's Mr. Uh, Better Butter Books. He writes it, he's retired about 15 years ago, but he still teaches butter at the university. It is yellow. U.S. Uh, butter, unless you color it, is kind of white. If you look at Land O'Lakes butters and stuff like that, the reason it is yellow is the cows are eating grass. They get all the stuff from the grass, uh, which has color compounds, carotenoids and other things, and that gets transferred into the butter. Definitely a different flavor. Um, but depends on who you're selling it to. I worked in New Zealand for four years, 
and the New Zealand also have cows that live on grass primarily and not indoors. And they were selling a lot of their butter to the Japanese market. And the Japanese did not like the flavor of butter that came from grass. So it was a problem for them, great marketing edge for Kerrygold. So they actually had equipment to try and separate out the color compounds from the cream so they would look white so they could sell it to Japan. So it really depends on the customer and what they want, is my short answer. Yes, milk and what they feed on can make a difference to the color, but also can affect some of the nutrients in there as well. So there's higher levels of things like CLA, which is conjugated linoleic acid, which is getting a lot of excitement for you know, maybe an anti-cancer, maybe anti-obesity. But the levels are maybe not high enough in our milk or our butter to maybe be have a huge impact on our health, but there's a lot of interest on it as well. So definitely what the cows, yeast can affect the cows eat can affect their flavors. Different sets, you know, when we're talking about milk prices, a different model. If you have grass all year round or most of the year round, like in Ireland, it gets wet in the winter. It's kind of like <laughs> what you have here today for about four months of the year. So the cows can't be outside because they'd make mud of all your fields. A different problem than snow. But what it allows you to do is you don't need as much housing because you're not housing them inside all the time. And if you just let them wander and graze paddocks all the day, you have to figure out which field they're going to graze on. But it's a very, what I would call, a low production cost model. You're not spending as much money to feed the cows. You're not getting as much milk, though. So the US model is not letting them walk around, keeping them indoors, and putting a lot of feed nutrients into the cows. So it's a much higher cost of producing the milk. But they also get more milk. So th somewhere there's a kind of a trade-off. Which, which, which system works? If you put in a lot of money into the farm and the feeding and the managing and so on, and you get enough milk out at a certain price, you, you make profit. But if you do all of these inputs and your milk price is low, you lose money. So different models, that's why we see um, some farms here in Wisconsin and other states switching back to grazing because they're really saying, okay, I'm not going to make as much milk, produce as much milk, but I'm not going to spend as much either producing that milk. Could that work for some farmers? Probably for some small and medium farmers that could work, and we see some of them have switched over the last 20 years. In fact, my first talk when I came here to uh, Madison, to our big show in 95, was about grazing in Ireland and how it affects cheese quality. Uh, this goes back to the pricing issue. I seem to remember uh, from my past life that milk prices on the commodity level were somehow other centered around Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And that either disadvantaged or advantaged Wisconsin farmers had to do with the distance from Eau Claire. Can no. you just explain that to the group a little bit and where, where that stands today? Because I know they were f trying to change that. But Yeah, so they have places where cheese was basically Horde and others were involved in this. They tried to come up with a system where cheeses would be bought to auctions, major auctions and major sites so that a proper price would be done rather than back house deals. So if you go back over 100 years ago, there was an attempt to try and bring it into centralized auctions where you would get a fair price and it would be public to everybody and everybody would know what you were getting. And a way to try and standardize the price for cheese. They eventually became centers of mercantile either within Chicago or places within Wisconsin that became the price and setting uh, places for cheese. And then the distance from those was part of the calculation for the price of cheese. A um, couple of things I would, I would bear in mind. That's primarily for kind of commodity type of product, and it's a benchmark for cheese makers in terms of milk price that they used in to calculate the price for the patrons that they supply to factories. But for the progressive cheese makers that making cheese that are not in commodity, maybe specialized, maybe making higher returns, they will pay more than what they're getting out of that back to their farmers that, you know, because they are making more from it. But it is, a, it is a complicated system, but like what we see from much of the dairy industry, many of the systems were put in place decades ago and are hard to change. They're either enshrined in federal regulations or other kind of processes, and our dairy industry is not very nimble to be able to break out of those and say, let's do something else. It really is very difficult for them. That's the common kind of theme, I would say, 
from, from both milk pricing or cheese pricing. Uh, we see a lot of that, or even just standards of identity. It's very difficult for them to move and, and go with the times. Um, in Wisconsin, you have your organic milk and you have the other milk. Yep. Um, yep. <laughs> is the organic milk also affected by this price thing? Organic milk, a um, couple of things about orga organic milk. So within organic milk, they have to have cattle uh, grazing a certain proportion of their uh, time and diet. So there's restrictions about what you can use in terms of antibiotics and things like that as well. We have some major businesses based in Wisconsin in our area like Organic Valley that are probably one of the biggest organic producers of product. Some of the other major producers of organic uh, are actually part of large organizations like White Wave and things like that, which are part of their own organization. So it started out as kind of what I would call small businesses, but some of the bigger businesses bought them out over time, so they're still keeping their, their brands. Uh, the price that they're paying back to the farmers is much, much higher than your commodity milk that's just going for non-organic or regular milk. That's true. There also was a lot of organic milk produced, um, so there was a lot of supply increased, and sometimes they didn't have enough products to make it into. And the second question is, what kind of products, if you, if you make some products from the milk, a lot of it is sold as milk, but a lot of it goes into organic cheese or powders or other kind of things. Many of them are looking for, what can I do with some of the byproducts? Because I've given a lot of money to the farmer to get this milk, much more than I would for regular milk, so I better use every part of the milk and every byproduct if I make cheese to get a return on it because I paid a lot of money to the farmer to it. So there is pressure on these companies too to make sure that they get full value returns from the high price that they pay for the farmers for organic milk. Because there wasn't enough supply in some parts, including here in Wisconsin, some of the organic milk has to be shipped in from many states over <laughs> to get enough supply to fill their, their growing needs over the last number of years. So it's been a challenge for them to get enough supply, um, and, and, and that's another kind of issue that they've had to deal with. Is there a difference between a store brand product as opposed to a name brand product? You can buy milk, the store brand, for $1.99 a gallon, mm -hmm. but like for Dean's or Kemp's, it might be $3.5 a gallon. One of the things we're seeing right now is that some, including Walmart, are actually building and buying their own um, milk processing facilities. They're kind of cutting out the middlemen that made their store brands in the past. Why? You know, when you look at it from supermarkets, whether they're as big as Walmart or the small convenience stores, what are the things that brings people in the door to shop? And milk is one of the main ones that bring, you know, cheese maybe, um, bread, milk. These are kind of things that will bring people into the store and then they will buy a whole bunch of other stuff. So from a, from a company point of view at the retailers, many times they don't mind not making any money on some products because they're attracting people into the store. They sometimes call them lost leaders, they call them, okay? So they really have squeezed the price down as low as possible because they want to get you in the door, and they may advertise it in their coupons or in their, uh, in their flyers per week, per week. Is there a difference between the quality? Usually not, at least in milk. <coughs> For some of the cheese products, it's, it's, you'd have to kind of go to a case-by-case -case basis. Some of the cheese products that are store brand are probably just as good as the regular brands, but not in all cases. I know there are brands of cheese out there that are really much better than the store brand, but I can't say that about every product. But I would say there certainly is brands out there that you would taste the, the, you know, the name brand and say, wow, that's great quality cheese, and the other stuff might be so-so. So milk, because it's pretty basic type of product, it's all made from cows, it's all been pasteurized in the same equipment and so on, it probably is very similar. You probably find it hard to determine the difference between the two. But cheese may be some differences. Uh, I had a question about um, rennet. I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could explain exactly why it causes milk to coagulate. And then a, a follow-up, if you use something other than rennet, are you still making cheese, or are you just making milk chunks or something okay. that's not cheese? <laughs> so, so I, I didn't hear the last part, sorry. Oh, okay, two chunks, okay. 
So rennet is an enzyme and it is a protein. So it's secreted on the stomach lining by uh, young calves and young mammals. The strange thing about it is it, oh, that particular rennet, which is an enzyme, enzymes are things that actually chop up things, which is what we're talking about here. They do other things as well. But it's designed and only produced when the calf is about less than one year old. Once the calf becomes you know, a year older, it, that enzyme is no longer produced. Okay? In that first year, the calf is likely to be still suckling the cow and getting access to milk. So this, is, this rennet enzyme that we're talking about is designed by the cow and the calf to be something produced when it's suckling milk. I teach classes uh, for our cheese makers down at the university, and I keep telling our cheese makers, you didn't invent cheese making, you borrowed it from the cow and the calf. They don't really like that, you know. <laughs> but literally, that's what we're doing. That was an enzyme produced by the calf when it was young, and once the calf gets older, it never produces that enzyme anymore. It produces another enzyme called pepsin. And we, we probably hear about pepto uh, acids and things like that. Pepsin, all of us have got pepsin in our stomach, and it's used to just uh, chop up proteins, just chop them up into small, small pieces so we can absorb it. But this enzyme that's produced in the calf is very different from this pepsin and just chops one bond on one of the proteins in milk. So it's really, really unique. Um, you asked about, is there other things that could do it? Yes. So one of the ones, and I had a student work on it a couple of years, the weirdest one I've seen, maybe, maybe it's not the weirdest, but I thought it was the weirdest, a flower, a thistle, okay? And it comes from Portugal and Italy. There's a, a thistle or a flower, and they take the top of the thistle of this flower not the rest of the plant, then they take it inside and just put it away and let it dry. And then when they want to make cheese, they take a bunch of these flowers, throw it in the cheese vat, wait about 10 minutes, and they screen out those flowers and the milk coagulates, just like it would from the calf one. How they figure that out? I don't know. <laughs> but they're making those cheeses since before Romans. That's what we know. Before the Romans came to Portugal, they were making those cheeses. So I think what happened is people are very adventurous, or maybe they're just very foolish, <laughs> and they try random things, and they've tried uh, this plant, we call it Sinara plant, but basically this plant they tried and it found that coagulates milk, and they actually have protected name cheeses in Portugal and Spain that are made from these plants and these flowers. So it's a true plant or vegetable uh, coagulant. So this is probably the weirdest ones. People have used figs and all sorts of other things over the years, but primarily it comes from either calf or... I got a weirder one for you. Camel. <laughs> Camels... Okay, I'll make the short sto story short. There's actually a lot of camel milk in the Middle Eastern countries. And they liked to make camel cheeses. I don't know what those cheeses are like, to be perfectly honest. But they make cheeses from the camel milk. And they had to use the calf enzyme to try and make their camel milk cheeses, and it did a lousy job. <laughs> so about 10 or 15 years ago, they went to some of the big enzyme suppliers and said, look, we really are not making good quality cheese using your calf enzyme to make our camel milk cheeses. Could you ever isolate the enzyme from the camels and the, the young camels? They must have this enzyme too and it would be designed to work in our camel milk better than this calf stuff. And one of the major enzyme suppliers said, yeah, cool, you know, it's no problem. Our technology's around now, it's very sophisticated, we can do that. So they isolated the enzyme from the calf stomach, put it in some, some yeasts, grew up the enzyme, and sold it to them. That wasn't what, what got weird. When they tasted, when they used this camel rennet, and they put it in cow's milk, it worked better than the calf enzyme. <laughs> Usually we think nature knows how to do the best design stuff, but it turns out that actually this camel rennet could clot cow's milk faster than the calf one. Actually, a lot of our cheeses in Wisconsin are now using this because it actually produces less bitterness. And that's, that's a factor for some of them. They say, mm, I'm worried about bitterness, maybe I'll use the camel stuff rather than the calf stuff. So it's manufactured and sold now. That's only the last 10 years. 
So there are products beyond the calf stuff that are used as rennets. And, and every, every year, someone tries to figure out the next greatest one. I don't know what the next animal will be, but probably not weirder than camel, I think. Have you figured out what the enzyme's purpose is in the calves? It is designed, to, the, the, the enzyme is designed to clot the milk, and its only target is one of the proteins on the, on the milk proteins. One, there are four major proteins in milk. It only clots one bond on one of the proteins. That's all it does. So it is really designed to do that. Why? The guess is, and we don't know, but the guess is that it probably helps the calf if instead of the milk staying in its stomach, because it often picks up a lot of infections and the milk might be passed through very quickly, is that if it can clot the milk into something that looks like soft cottage cheese, you can slow down the milk going through their digestive system and that they can actually fully digest all of the milk. So I, we think it's a trick to slow down the passage of milk, allow the calf to clot it into something like semi-solid soft gels, and then it sits in the stomach for a little bit longer and it allows it to fully digest and get all the nutrients. We think it's something to do with that, is the most likely scenario. Because otherwise, it has no other role in actually digesting it. If it, if it was just about, let's chop up the milk as soon as possible, you wouldn't pick the rennet enzyme. You would pick the enzyme that the adult cow has, the pepsin. It is much more aggressive in, in digesting it fast. But you mightn't get it through in time, and the calf might actually um, have a scour or infection or other kind of things and may lose that nutrient. So it, it's probably something related to that, we think. I have another question. Um, back to something you mentioned earlier uh, in the evening about the milk that doesn't need to be refrigerated and has a longer shelf life. Um, mm -hmm. Back in my Navy days, 15, 20 years ago, I remember being out to sea for six months at a time and getting milk that could sit on a shelf, and I thought it was terrible. So is this milk going to be better? <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this milk, actually, um, what we call UHD milk, or our, our, our sterile milk, is available right now in Europe. And actually, if you go to some countries in the world, they, that's the primary source of the milk. They may go for some regular fresh milk, literally like our gallon jugs for some products. Does it taste better or worse? That's a great question. I think many people, what they would do is they it would allow them actually to leave stacks of it here in either cartons or containers anywhere in the house or in the basement or something like that. Just kind of like what we do with beer at the moment. Sometimes we don't put our beer into the fridge until maybe we're thinking about drinking it because cold beer is probably better than warm beer for most of us. I think the same analogy would be true here, that maybe before you drink that um, aseptically processed milk, that you would probably put it in and get it cold, because it maybe tastes better to us. Does it taste different otherwise? If it's made properly, that's where the science comes in. Maybe a slight little cooked note, kind of like what you'd get if you boiled milk. Mm -hmm. Slight amount of that, but that's about all. Good. Fascinating evening. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, we're going to give out some cheese. We're going to give out some cheese, so come on up. But before that, let me just remind you of our, um, our sponsors, Monaco Public Library, uh, Trout Lake Station, Camp Natural Resources Station, Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, our host here, Monaco Brewing Company, and our funding from the Brittingham Fund and our next Science on Tap will be uh, June 5th uh, with Jason Fletcher talking about the social impl implications of the genomics revolution. Um, Kemp Natural Resources Station uh, flyers for their outreach events through the summer will be in the back. Uh, so as you're leaving, please pick up a flyer. And don't forget about the event Friday, May 10th on... Um, Timberdoodles, the American Woodcock, uh, Friday, May 10th, 7 p.m. at Kemp Natural Resources Station. So thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you next month. And come on up and get a sample of some cheese. Oh, two of oh he's only got two. I okay. Got two. So we're going to have to select. Oh, oh, oh. So somebody's going to get a prize. Somebody's got a prize. Okay. So all right. We're going to we're gonna have to figure out who gets the prize. Oh, all right. Well, let's, let's get see. Stuff. Uh, any more questions? If it was a really good one. <laughs>
<laughs> what, was your, what was your favorite question? Well, I like the Kerrygold one, so I'm going to give one to the Kerrygold one. <laughs> yeah. Milk pricing. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.